Hello. Hello. Hello again. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> All right, we'll just wait for people to jump on. Here they come. How's everybody doing tonight? Mute. Give people another minute or two. Well, while we wait for people, just remember that we are recording this evening. And if you don't want to be on camera, to go ahead and turn that off and to also keep yourself muted um, while our presenting is going on so that we aren't distracted. Um, and a question for you as you check in in the chat. Um, tell us something about your prior experience with press releases, media, story sharing work, if anyone feels like they want to drop that in the chat while we wait. And tonight we're going to be talking about storytelling, communication skills, digital tactics, art tools, and storytelling. Um, and we have some really great folks presenting tonight. Um, we have Thanu, Fro, who's our U.S. Communications Manager at 350.org. We have Avery, who's a U.S. Digital Campaigner at 350.org. And we are graced with having Ingrid tonight. Um, she's the Arts and Cultural Organizing Coordinator from PCM. So a big welcome to all of our trainers this evening. And just to remind everybody, as of tomorrow, we have one month until RISE. So we are coming down on the wire. I hope everybody's excited. And I hope everybody's event planning is going well. And always remember that you can email um, me at amy.gray at 350.org. And I'll drop that in the chat if you need any help organizing or have any questions. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Thanu to start talking about media communications. Great, hi everyone. Um, thanks so much for having me. My name is Thanu Yakupitiege. I am the US Communications Manager at 350. Um, and I am coordinating a lot of the communications for the Rise for Climate jobs and um, justice marches um, across the country with a focus on California. Um, and I'm here today to really talk about um, just the role of media and communications in storytelling. And I'm really gonna focus on really how to build a press plan to maximize your storytelling. Um, so you can follow along with me um, in the presentation from slide four, which is the opening slide. 
to my presentation. Um, so slide five, um, I want to talk about sort of the power of the story. And I think one of the things that people say about this day and age is that if you don't, um, you know, take a photo of something, if you don't record something, if you don't like amplify it, your event maybe didn't actually happen. Like, what does it, um, it, it it's more about like, how, how is it that you can actually get your story out there so that it's more than just you and like the people who are at the event who know about it. Um, and so amplification is a huge part of organizing. It's a huge part of advocacy. Um, and it's a huge part of what we're, we do in the climate movement. Um, so when I say communications, what I mean is traditional media. Um, so in um, my team, and, and by the way, uh, uh, Lindsay Mayman is also on the phone. She's on my team and she'll actually also be staying on to answer your questions because I have to go a little bit early. Um, and we, the two of us and our um, other colleague, Danny, make up the communications team at 350. Um, and we do a lot of work with traditional, traditional media. So we work with reporters. Um, we work through the press to tell strategies and stories um, of our campaigns and movement. Um, and for us, communications is storytelling. It's really about building buzz about our work and campaigns through media platforms. Um, and it's about getting news. It's really about, um, you know, making sure that like our um, angle on climate, on climate justice is really also being told by the media. Um, and we try to do that in proactive ways. And we really try to elevate um, people who, um, you know, are really representative of their struggles in the, their local areas to be the ones who are um, speaking to the press. Um, and so what can communications do for you um, with your rise for climate jobs and justice action? Um, comms can help you build buzz. Um, it can help you reach new audiences. It can help you pressure and hold decision makers accountable. It helps to educate the public and it helps to sort of validate existing supporters um, of, of your work. Um, and so if you go to slide six around amplifying your action, when I say amplifying, I mean using media as a tool to get your message out far and wide. Um, and essentials of amplifying your action include um, several things. So, um, if you are um, the lead or the host of um, your Rise to Climate Jobs and Justice um, action in your area, um, identifying a communications point. I know that um, for some of these actions, there might be like very few of you working on it, but um, if and where possible, um, it, would be, it would be great to designate someone else to be your communications point. And that communications point would help to build um, a press list uh, in your local area. I'm sorry, I'm seeing some um, chats. Do people not have the slides? Oh, thanks, Avery. So I'm on slide six right now, and I started on slide four. Um, where was I? Yeah, so um, around building your own press list, the, the, easiest way to do that is to first like really assess like you know who who your local media is so there's usually um you know local reporters or local news desk and to start with gathering the press information um phone numbers contact emails for your local news desks and then you can sort of expand from there um and one way is in which 350 can help is that um you're welcome to either email me or Lindsay. I have our contact information on one of the other slides um, in this deck. Um, you can also email us if you're looking for specific contact information of a certain um, you know, media entity and we can get that for you. Um, and putting together a press plan includes things like um, putting together sort of a plan of like when you're gonna be sending out media advisories for the lead up weeks before an action um, getting together quotes of relevant spokespeople for your press release um, and putting together a spokespeople roster um, of folks who can speak towards the event and what you're highlighting. Um, if you go to, to slide seven um, and on the comms role in spokespeople. So like I said before, it's really important to have a com communications lead if you can, because otherwise one person is juggling too many roles. And so the communications lead is in charge of the action media plan, um, 
the, that person is point on press outreach, answering background questions and connecting reporters to your spokespeople. Um, and one thing to note, the comms lead is not necessarily a spokesperson. They're usually the one who like connects up um, reporters to spokespeople. Um, the comms lead is, is someone who crafts and sends all press materials and also tracks and shares press hits. Um, and the what the communications lead is not is um, not necessarily a spokesperson and not necessarily a lead on social media and digital. So the way we like to do it at 350 is we actually keep our traditional media um, comms folks separate from our digital folks. That may not always um, be possible, uh, but um, if there is potentially another person who could be doing social media work, that usually makes the load a little bit less heavy on one person. Um, and so then for spokespeople, one thing to really think about as you're putting together your action is like, who are the two to three top people, um, you know, from your action who's part of the organizing, who can have the role of speaking publicly on behalf of your campaign or on behalf of the action. And so your comms point is going to help to identify those people. And um, one thing you should look out for, and this will come in the materials that we'll share with you, is that I'm going to be sending a form that you can um, fill out that will, where you can specify who your comms point is for your action and who some of your spokespeople are. And that would be great for just us to know as we're coordinating things on a national level because we just want to know, you know, who's who's the comms point for your action that we can really quickly get in touch with if i get a call from a reporter who really wants to talk, talk to someone from miami for instance i'm gonna reach out to the comms point and the comms point um will have a sense of who those spokespeople are so we want to be able to share this information back and forth so that we can more easily connect y'all with press um if you go to slide eight <clears throat> Um, this is on pitching and communicating your story. So um, one of the, the, the most important thing about when you're planning an action is being able to communicate that the action is happening. And so once you've built your press list or know which press you're reaching out to, um, writing your local reporters. So you can send them the media advisory that you've put together, or you can even send them a personal note. Um, I find that you know, if, if, you're try if you're sending a media advisory to a bunch of reporters, certainly you can BCC them, but it always helps to send a personal note. Um, also calling reporters, um, but when you call reporters, you should really keep it short um, only, and with key information about the action because reporters are always slammed with people trying to get them to cover their events. And also do some research, like is there a local reporter who has covered climate in your area before that you could reach out to? Because knowing the particular interest of a reporter can also really help with like making sure that um, what you're doing um, is of interest to the reporter. I see that we have some new folks. So I'm just going to repost the slide deck. And so folks can follow along. I'm on slide eight and I'm moving on to slide nine. So on, um, on pitching and communi communicating your story, um, Keep it local. So um, if you have an action in Minnesota or in Texas, like there's a way in which you can really connect what's going on in your own community to, you know, larger global national or state movements. And so in this case, because the Rise for Climate Actions, it's, it's, a, it's a national and a global day of action. Um, you're basically connecting up your local action and your local story to something bigger um, and, you know, that's why in like in your media advisors, you should always say like this is part of hundreds of events happening around the country and the world um, to push um, for our elected officials to take um, action on climate. Um, so that really connects um, the local up to the global. Um, but keeping a local like being very specific also about like why it is that like you're rising for climate in your area is also going to be of interest to press. Um, Keep it timely. So a question that reporters will often ask is like, why now? Um, so definitely keep up to date with what's uh, local and in the national news. Um, you know, so, so for example, right now in California, um, there's wildfires brewing like across the world, there's all sorts of climate impacts. And so we've really been using that as a timely way to really connect up um, 
our rise actions to you know the realities of climate impacts across the world um there's also been some recent press um news articles from the new york times magazine to the atlantic that have been making arguments about um how um it's going to be impossible to fix climate change for example and so we've been really responding to those and also using these like big stories as a way to also push our rise to climate actions. Um, and again, keep it simple. Reporters are impatient. Keep your call and pitch simple and make it personal. I think the one thing I've learned from doing comms work is that personal stories and like why people have a stake in the fight is why people want to cover it. Reporters want to cover something. And um, while it's easy to refer to numbers, facts and figures, um, really having good spokespeople who have interesting stories um, whether it's, um, you know, someone who's impacted by a pipeline or whether it's, um, you know, a mom who's fighting for the future of her kid. Like, those are the kinds of stories um, that really resonate with the press. Slide 10, um, around building a press list. So, again, like I said, you should really get info on your local news desks. And if you need support in reaching out to outlets, um, email us and we can help. And I've put Lindsay Maimon's contact information um, and her email is just lindsay at 350.org um, and on writing a media advisory on on um, the slide slide 10 um, I've uh, linked to some training materials um, and you can take a look at that it, it really shows you how to write a media advisory how to write a press release um, and just so that so so that you know the difference between a media advisory and a press release i'm sorry if this is redundant a media advisory is really short it basically is has like a title a snazzy title it has the what when where why of your action and you send this out before an action so i would recommend you send this out two weeks ahead of september 8th again one week out and again a day before but also during that time, you should be pitching to press. So don't expect that you're just gonna send out an immediate advisory and then miraculously you're gonna get press. You're gonna also have to do the proactive calling and pitching as well. A press release is what goes out after your event. Um, and this should include photos. So this is where you have more extensive quotes and more extensive paragraphs about like what happened um, you know, during your action and what the relevance of the action is. Um, and on slide 11, there's actually, uh, we've linked uh, templates for your advisories and press releases. So you can take a look. Uh, these are templates for um, the Rise for Climate Jobs and Justice actions. Um, and again, like these are just suggestions of language. You can obviously use whatever language you want, but these are just um, some suggested templates that you're free to use to make things easier for you. Um, and then um, I also often get a quest the question of like, um, well, if I get interviewed, what am I going to say? So that's why you have to do some pre prep prep. So if you have designated spokespeople, um, you should um, help uh, help those spokespeople to prepare. You could do some um, mock interviews with your spokespeople. Um, but those spokespeople are the ones who should do the interviews. Like if you are the comms point, um, you're the one who's sort of connecting the press to your spokespeople. Um, something that I took from Sierra Club's materials, KISS, uh, keep it simple, stupid, at least for TV. Um, speak, speak slowly and um, make sure that um, you're speaking in a way that is really relevant um, to what, you know, everyday people, um, you know, listen to. So um, what I do when I speak on TV is that I speak as if I'm speaking to a teenager. Um, because if you use too many big words, you're actually just confusing people and you don't actually get your message across because it's, um, it's too complex. Um, and always, uh, when you're getting interviewed, have some key um, talking points already in your head and st start with your strongest statement and be passionate and sort of lead with positive solutions um, and practice in advance. So you can practice in the mirror, you can um, put together some talking points and make sure you just have this in advance for you. Um, and then on slide 13, um, I've actually just linked to a toolkit full of resources for interviews, pitching, press material templates that my colleague Lindsay put together. Um, so again, feel free to take a look at that as well. Um, and lastly, on slide 14, um, just, uh, you know, once your action is wrapped up, um, it doesn't mean that you're like, okay, great, everything is done. There's a lot of post-action follow-up that needs to happen. 
So one of the things to keep in mind is tracking and collecting press. So keep track of press for your actions, set Google alerts for key, key spokespeople's names, um, for rise of climate jobs and justice, climate rally, any other relevant search words um, with um, maybe uh, your location as well. That'll help you track press. Um, another thing that helps with post action follow up is signing in press at the event or getting reporters cards. So at the event itself, you should have like a comms point person and that person can either be like as press come um, to the designated press area, um, you can be checking them in on like a clipboard or you can be getting their cards. And so what you can do is you can follow up with that press um, after the event to see if they wrote a story or broadcasted one and to potentially get the link. Um, and this is also a really good way to keep in touch with reporters, especially if you're planning on continuing to do work on this issue in your area. Um, this helps you to really build a press list and really build relationships with these reporters for any other actions that happen um, after the one that you're um, working on currently. Um, that's all I have. Um, are we doing questions now, Amy? Or? Sure, we can definitely. And then if you need to go, of course, and then Lindsay's here so she can help answer questions. But if anybody has any questions um, about the slide presentation or the media and press stuff, please don't hesitate to drop it in the chat and I will field your call, your questions. And if we don't have any questions, then we'll move on to Avery. Sorry, Perfect. everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, excellent. So I'm going to um, attempt to share my screen really quickly. And here we are. So, so sorry. <laughs> Great, well, <laughs> as this presentation loads. Um, I'm here today to talk to you all about digital storytelling, which is a really integral part of organizing for um, any day of action and also just a skill set that you should use in your local organizing outside of RISE. So, oh, you know what, Wait one second. There you go, now you can see it. Um, so the really amazing thing about digital storytelling and social platforms is that you're able to connect with people from all across the world. It's so important that we stay really rooted in our communities with our organizing, but by being able to share our stories on social platforms, we're able to see ourselves in our communities in places that are, are everywhere across the nation. Um, and so, you know, just posting by yourself isn't, isn't going to be enough. Um, you really got to get the word out there to make a big impact and the tips that Bonnie just shared are really vital and important and can help you to do so. But if you aren't equipped um, to, with any of that, those skill sets, it's really easy to just be able to pick up your phone, get on social, um, and start reaching a ton of people. Oh, lovely. Okay, cool. Um, so actions are really flashy, catchy events. Um, they're a really great turning point to grab folks' attentions and bring them towards the issues that you work on year-round. Um, so, so be sure to, uh, during RISE on the day of action, be sure to um, be doing a lot of live coverage. Things are going to get really crazy and hectic and there's going to be so much going on. But even if you can snap photos or videos that you can share after the fact, um, that will do a really great job to direct folks towards your local campaigns afterwards. So what are some of the best ways to get the word out about or to showcase your action? Facebook Live. I'm sure um, most of you are familiar with Facebook and I'm sure most of you have seen a Facebook Live at one point, but it out of all the platforms right now um, and live streaming options, it currently still gets the best reach. So you're able to broadcast from, say, your local um, 350 chapter page or PCM hub if you have a Facebook page or your personal Facebook page. Be sure to use hashtags. With anything that you post in order to connect it with RISE more broadly, be sure to include your hashtags. 
Um, and also, you know, Facebook Live is not just about pointing and shooting a video. Um, it's a chance for you to be able to talk to your audience, for you to allow others who are taking part in the action to speak their piece as well. Um, if you don't have access to mobile data or things are just so hectic that you don't have adequate time um, or energy to devote to a Facebook Live, just record a video. Um, Afterwards, you're, the great thing about that is that you're able to share it all across the platforms. And not only across platforms, you can shoot it in a quick email or text to others in your community as well. If you're not so keen on Facebook, given everything that's going on, wouldn't blame you, um, Instagram Stories is a great alternative to Facebook Live. The difference being with Instagram Stories that people would already have to be following your page. Um, after 24 hours, everything that you post on your story goes away and not all of your follower, followers will always receive an, uh, a notification that you have posted a story or have done Instagram Live. And Instagram Live, I'm sorry, I should have said this a second ago, Instagram Live functions similarly to Facebook Live. Um, pictures, classic way to showcase uh, events, rallies, marches. Great to post them on Instagram. Um, it's really important that you're not just posting photos of a, catch, a sign with a catchy slogan. With everything that you share, be thinking about the personal narrative behind it. Try to showcase faces. Try to showcase the, showcase the actual pe people and environments that are being affected and that you're out here rallying for. Um, once you have those photos, share them on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, send them around. Yes. So in thinking about what the best way is for you to cover your event, think on these, uh, a couple of these questions. What sort of equipment do you have access to? Do you simply have a mobile phone that has mobile data or could connect to Wi-Fi? Do you have a really nice uh, or just a good DSLR camera that takes great high quality photos that you're, would probably outperform the camera on your phone? How much of a lift do you want this media to be? With Rise, the thing, the, and any day of action, the key, one of the key things is to be timely. You don't want to backload your media that's coming out. The day of, as presently as possible, you should really try to be pushing out that content that people can sort of follow along with. And then afterwards, you're able to send out more content um, that dives deeper into the stories about why this is happening. You're also able to front load that content if you would like, if you'd like to start writing op-eds or blog posts or anything like that and sharing on your channels. But be thinking about how much of a time commitment you really wanna put into this. And if it's a minimal time commitment, then focus on the day of action itself. Um, think through what platforms you have access to and not only what platforms you have access to, but which platforms you have the largest following on and if it's not yourself and you have access to your local community or pages, think about which page it makes the most sense to share on. Um, pages, for instance, on Facebook are able to cross post videos and other content. So be thinking about how you can get the most traffic towards your media. Which form of media do you want to use? Just kind of touched on that. And then something long form or short, short form. For instance, something short form could be you walking around at your local Rise events, snapping pictures of people and just getting sort of like a sentence or two about why they're there and posting like four or five of those photos and those quotes on your Instagram. Pretty short form. Or do you want to do something long form that involves you um, shooting a fair amount of video and getting footage from several different locations as well as the day of the action to tell the broader story hit on the broader narrative that really encapsulates what's happening in your community and why your folks are rising up. Both options are great. Again, it's how much time that you're able to put into it. And you also need to be thinking about the goals of your campaign and your rise action. So what are some snazzy things that people like to see uh, that grabs their attention? People love to see preparation and the work that goes behind uh, Days of Action. You all have been working so incredibly hard to pull these events together and 
honestly, show off your efforts. Take, a, you know, if you're doing an art build, go ahead and take a few photos or a quick Instagram story of the amazing art that's being worked on. Um, if you're having a general like mass meeting about your res event, snap a picture of the crowd or maybe some of the speakers who are addressing the crowd. People love to see what's go what has gone into crafting these uh, these days of action. Um, when things get started, that is the best time for you to really start hitting with some of that short form content, um, or if you're doing Instagram Live or Facebook Live. Be sure to introduce and restate, I can't stress this enough, restate throughout what is happening, why you are there, um, and the hashtag or whatever page or whatever it is that you've decided to use that they should be following along with. Let them know, hey, I'm Avery Rains. I'm here in Washington, D.C., and we're about to kick off our Rise for Climate March. Thousands have gathered here today, X, Y, Z, as an example. Um, if you find anybody having a particularly great time or doing things that are uh, really interesting, say that you have folks who have gone all out and have dressed up for your rally or march or action, whatever it may be, um, pick out the fun things that are in the crowd. If you have musicians at your event, record a little bit of them. Um, anything that is sort of stands out from the typical march with signs photos, I would definitely encourage you to showcase. Um, all of our actions across the country are, are really unique and we should show that there are variances in all of them. Depending on the nature of your action, it is incredibly important to, if it's more geared towards civil disobedience or NVDA, um, say it's like a benefit concert or a rally with a really um, well, high profile, well-known speaker, be sure to position yourself to capture that moment of escalation prior to when it happens. And again, restate why you're there, what is happening and what the larger goals are. Um, this takes a little bit of pre-planning if it's like nonviolent, uh, if it's NBDA, then you know timing can get a little odd sometimes, and it may not be the easiest to do. But always try to strategically preposition yourself to be able to capture that moment of escalation. Um, and finally, keep it personalized. We all have our stories about why we do this work. Everybody has a story about why how climate change is impacting your lives, so whether or not they know it. Make sure that you're reaching out to people, coming into contact with them, and talking to them about why they are at your RISE event. That's really what folks want to hear. We want to show, we want a strong force of unity from across the world that folks can follow along with and see like, hey, people are, across the world are rising up for climate and it's because we're all frustrated where things, with where things are at, but we're all incredibly hopeful and are going to work together to craft the world that's just and equitable that we can all live in for future generations. I will also plug at this time using hashtag rise for climate or hashtag why we rise. Um, you can be following along of those hashtags all day long and they will probably gain the most traction. So be sure with your media that you're putting, your social media that you're putting out to use those. Some fun little storytelling tips. Again, stories are about people. You can't really tell a story without a subject, so be sure to hit on those personal narratives. You don't always have to, even though I have just instructed you to root things um, in why you're, where you are and why you're there, things don't have to be static and stagnant in terms of time and place. Um, our, these climate flights are dynamic, they are longstanding, and they're going to continue happening. What happens on September 8th is going to set the stage for what's going to continue happening forward, going forward. Stories speak the audience's language. Two big points on this one. Number one, <coughs> excuse me. Um, number one, we need to keep language justice in mind, if at all possible. So if you live in an area um, where another language is predominantly spoken and you have access to somebody who speaks said language, try and incorporate them um, or I get them to add to your content as well because we want it to be as accessible for everyone um, as possible. Um, number two, somebody once gave me a piece of advice that I really um, 
that has really held true in my time and working in digital, and that is speak to your audience as though they are in the eighth grade. Doesn't sound so nice, but really what they were trying to say is just keep it simple, keep it succinct, keep it to the point. We can, we're all really creative people. We can tend to get really flowery and, and long-winded with our language. Speak the audience's language. Where are we? What, do, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Give them what they want to know. Again, rooting it in the personal narratives, speak to their emotions as well. Um, you can do that through photo and video, and, and it's easy to convey those emotions through video and, and photos as well. Um, stories have at least one moment of truth. They also have a clear meaning, again, being precise, succinct. Um, and articulating your goals and objectives for why you're rising, you know? There's a reason that everybody in these communities are banding together to make a stand. Um, what is it that we want? It's climate justice. Um, let your community members speak for themselves. There's a lot of really great advocates such as yourselves that are, that are out here, but sometimes we get into a little bit of an echo chamber hearing the same uh, climate advocate voices over and over again. RISE will be a really great chance to let some of your community's members speak up and talk about their experience and what they are doing or what they would like to do within your communities. Um, audiences do bore easily, hence speak to them like they're in the eighth grade. I would argue at this point, given with how social media has developed and, and transformed, maybe try to speak to them like they're in like they're in like fifth or sixth grade. People have really short attention spans. Try not to make a fight, like definitely don't do a Facebook Live that's an hour and a half. People are going to drop off after like 10 minutes unless it's something that's really crazy, engaging, direct action or something that's so fascinating that everybody's fixated on it, can't look away. That's usually not the case. So try to keep your things really succinct. Um, and I will share that video research or resource on the trainings page. That's about it for me. Does anybody have um, any questions? I can also answer questions at the end. I don't want to cut too much into it. Yeah, there was one somebody typed in the chat that was, um, she said, I usually include a logo of our group and the sponsoring group 350 in the press release. I also attach separate graphics files to the emailed release. Is that helpful or not really necessary? And I also include a photo image that is especially meaningful, also useful in the press release, question mark. I am not going to answer the press release question because uh, traditional comms is not my area of expertise. We'll I let Lindsay. <laughs> I was about to tap in Lindsay. Lindsay, do you mind taking that one? While I ping Lindsay, I can speak to, um, I can speak to attaching files with, oh, Lindsay said, yes, photo and press release. Sorry, having trouble getting off mute. No problem, Lindsay. Um, so that's good to know from the traditional comms standpoint. I am always going to encourage you to add share files of any graphics, videos, any content that can be shared out by your partners or other local community groups. Attaching them in email is a really great way to do so. Um, so yeah, I would absolutely say that that is something that you should do, um, if at all possible. I don't see any other questions in the chat right now. Um, any other things on folks' mind? Cool. If not, you can, I'll, I'll be here at the end to answer questions. So. Uh, with that, I am going to go ahead and pass it off to Avery. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Maybe I can get a nod from Avery, Amy, who I can see right now. All right. Okay. Hey, everyone. My name is Ingrid Haftel. I am PCM's Arts and Cultural Organizing Coordinator, and I'm going to ask for your participation this fine evening. Um, so while I get my presentation ready to share, uh, could you get out a pen, pencil, piece of paper, boot up MS Paint, whatever will let you doodle for a second. So do that. I'm going to get my presentation up. I'll be back with you in a second. Okay. All right. 
righty. Can everyone see my presentation? Right on. Okay, so I would love it if everyone could start by doodling, drawing what climate justice means to you. And I want you to draw it. I don't want you to use any words. And we'll take one minute to do this, okay? I was going to play some music while we did this, but that was a little too ambitious for me this evening. Sorry. Okay, you have another 30 seconds. Ten seconds. Okay, pencils down. Does anyone want to share what they came up with? You can show it, you can hold it up. I'll scroll through my video feed. You could also enter in the chat box. Anyone have anything they want to share? I'll share with you what I came up with. You want to see what I came up with? Aha, what do we have here? Okay, Amy, show us, tell us what you drew. I see that's a fist and a heart and a sun and an earth. Okay, excellent. What do we have, Kate? Beautiful. Okay, I think I see some mountains. There might be a tree or a geyser in the background. Some people with the hands linked. Lovely. Anyone else? Okay, well, if I missed you, we can share at the end. I'm gonna sh share. Um, we just had like a major thunderstorm in Brooklyn here, so this is like my water geyser spout. It's, it's our groundswell. And then these are the balloons, the unconnected, unresponsive, oppressive balloons up in the air, unconnected to us right now. And I want our groundswell to pour water down onto all of those balloons. So you guys had some very wonderful, thoughtful, succinct ways of visualizing climate justice. It can also be a little less literal as mine was. Um, but the point of that exercise was just to get us in the headspace of thinking about our organizing from a different perspective. Um, so using visuals to express what's meaningful and urgent about our work and how we can use art to make marginalized things that are marginalized or invisible visible. So that's really the big idea um, when, I, when I'm talking to you all tonight about arts and cultural organizing and using that for storytelling. Um, it's not so much to make things pretty, although you absolutely can and should do that with art. Um, but it's also to think about how we can use art to share our perspectives and make our struggles stand out and speak loudly to the world. Um, so I wanted to take a look at spe a specific example. Um, for folks who were at the 2014 People's Climate March in New York, this might look familiar, maybe you've seen it before. Um, but I think this image really does speak a thousand words. And um, if I could just ask you all to enter into the chat, what do you notice about this photo? And it can be anything from the most obvious to the least obvious. What do you notice? The people. Yep. Bright, vibrant colors, lots of yellow and sunny colors. There are great signs, absolutely. There's a theme. You see kids holding signs in front. There's unity in numbers. Excellent, yes, absolutely. Um, so these are all things that we can see in just this one image. Um, one of the things that stands out to me about this image is you see front lines of crisis, forefront of change. Um, so the frontline communities are in the front of this march um, and the art and action visuals really hold space for those who are first and most impacted by climate change to tell their own stories and speak their struggle. Um, the great banners we see, they're captions for the crowd, right? Those powerful, simple messages um, actually create a narrative about our movement with people in space. 
Um, and the colors and the simple visuals that that sunflower, even though it's a simple visual, it's repeated and it really creates unity in a crowd. That simple visual with unifying colors can be really powerful. Um, and then another thing that I think stands up out about this image is everyone can participate um, from the master sign makers who made the front lines of crisis banner to folks drawing sunflowers, right, and making those pretty easy to make signs. Um, it's really accessible to all different skill levels. Um, and so with that in mind, my big pitch to you tonight um, is that you start, if you haven't already, to think about art as an organizing strategy. Um, and I'll tell you a couple of reasons why that is the case. Um, art and cultural interventions can really open the doors of our organizing to people and create a sense of belonging. Um, so we know this is critical to building enduring grassroots power, is those personal connections that people can make by making art together and sharing their stories through art, visual art, music, dance, performance. I'm really going to focus on visual art tonight which means I'm going to leave out so much. And there, if you're interested in talking about stuff that's not covered here, um, I'll absolutely make sure you have my email address and we can continue the conversation. Um, art can make information accessible and engaging. Um, so the information that we want to share with one another um, oftentimes can be complex, can be intimidating, but by using visual song performance and other artistic forms, we can really humanize that work and make the complex systems we're fighting more accessible to people. Um, finally, a big one is that art as an organizing strategy really supports artists and art in communities. Um, so it's an investment in arts and cultural work and it's also in the communities that artists and cultural producers work in. Um, I wanted to take a minute and actually I might skip over this for a second because I think we'll do this at the end with your ideas. Um, but I do want to come back to what you're specifically doing and where you are um, because you're going to be seeing a lot of images from past marches and mobilizations. But what I really want to emphasize tonight is that it's not just about creating art for marches and rallies. If you're holding a summit, a teach-in, a speaker's forum, a town hall, you can think about visual art and other art forms um, too. It's not just about making signs and banners for marches, although that's critical as well. Um, so what I want to do is just show you some images to kind of spark your imagination um, and get you thinking about potential projects you could take on for your events in September. Um, and through that, I'm going to show you some art of every size, shape, and story. Um, so the first one we'll see here, this is an image from 2014 as well, poster. So this is a poster created by an artist and activist, some of you might know, Fabiana Rodriguez. This really iconic image, Defend Our Mother. Um, and poster projects can be a really accessible place to start. It might mean connecting with one artist to help you tell the story of your action on September 8th, or it might be inviting a range of artists to contribute their visions and really kind of opening up um, the field for letting people share their visions for what rising for climate jobs and justice looks like. Um, I wanted to point out that everything I show you tonight, you will also be getting links to resources to help you create. So that includes toolkits for how to pull this off, what kind of supplies you might need. And I'm also going to connect you to some resources in terms of networking and organizing together around arts and cultural organizing in the future. Banners. So we saw a lot of those in the first image, but clearly this is um, an accessible, easy way to bring art and visuals into your event. And it's also not just for rallies and marches. If you're holding a summit or a teach-in, Think about the space you're in and how you can use that space to tell a story and enliven it through visuals. Murals. So um, if anyone's joining us from California, uh, you probably already know that one of the projects on the slate there is pulling off the biggest street mural in the world. Um, so communities from across California and beyond are coming together to create a massive street mural, which is going to be amazing. Um, and we're also putting the call out to other communities who are interested in doing a street mural and have a toolkit for that as well. Um, it doesn't have to be permanent. If you feel a little unsure about moving into public space, there are all kinds of ways to do this, but it's a really powerful participatory way to get folks together creating a visual that really tells your story. This is just another example of simple visuals repeated, right? So these are flags and banners. Um, with a really simple wind and sun image. And these are actually available on 350's website too, so you'll get a link to that. Um, they can be screen printed, printed out, you can have a coloring party, you can make your own. Um, but again, just that repetition of simple images that you can brainstorm and vision together with your organizing crew um, and the artist you're connected with um, is a really powerful way to bring unity through the visuals in your organizing. 
I wanted to do a couple plugs for some popular education tools that you can use too. Um, so what we have here um, are some examples of, and I always, these are Cantastoria. I always mess up the word, but um, they're basically painted PowerPoints, right? That use visuals to communicate. You can use these in trainings, you can use these in rallies, you can use these in teach-ins, but using visuals to break down key pieces of our movement building. So whether that's looking at the fossil fuel industry um, or looking at actions and local solutions that you want to communicate and organize around, thinking creatively about how to tell that information and explain that information to people through simple visuals and then using those as training tools. Um, and then we have a couple groups this year who are interested in zines, handouts, um, short, you know, and thinking also economically and environmentally about printing, but thinking about what folks might be able to take away from your event as well. Um, is there something that you want a tool that you want to create that folks can take and share. Um, collaborating with artists on visuals for a simple flyer or a zine or a poster that folks can take and bring to their communities is another relatively easy lift for a project um, for your September 8th actions. Um, and finally, I just wanted to show an image of um, particip a pat thinking about participatory projects. Um, how can you use art and visuals to invite people to tell their own stories? Um, and this right here is a project called the Climate Ribbon. Um, it's actually been touring and has been across this country and other parts of the globe over the past few years. So you might have seen it before, but I think it's a really powerful example. What you do here, all you need is ribbon and somewhere to tie the ribbon. Um, and what you do is that is you write down what you love and don't want to lose to climate change. So a powerful example of a participatory project that can invite people in to tell their own stories and also really create a colorful art project on top of it. Um, what I wanted to do was note that what we just looked at was tiny. The possibilities are gigantic. Um, we did not talk about music, food, poetry, spoken word, games, performances, dancing. Um, as I already said before, um, there are a million ways to think about integrating art and culture into your events. And certainly from an accessibility perspective, thinking about engaging as many senses as possible is a great thing to think about as you're organizing for your events. Um, so I just wanted to pause here for a second. I think I have about, yeah, eight minutes left and see if folks wanted to share any ideas, anything that this is sparking, questions you have. We can also do this at the end of the presentation if folks don't have questions right now. What I'm gonna end with is just a couple tips for how to actually pull this off and then some resources and some actions you can take right away. Cool, we've got time. So I can sit here and wait for the questions to roll in. Thoughts, anything that stood out to you? Things you want to talk more about? Okay, get those questions queued up in your head because I will do this again. And let's take a look at some simple tools and strategies for how to do it. Um, so first, obvious, right? Um, invite artists to the table. Um, early and often. So if you're not, and don't worry, there may, I should have started by asking, you know, are there artists on the call? And we should definitely get folks to chime in once we do um, Q&A here. But if you're not connected to folks who can help you vision and do this work, that's fine. Um, we can help you get connected to those folks. You can also reach out to, it might be uh, folks, other folks in the movement, arts and cultural spaces in your community, um, artists want to be asked to be involved in this work, right? It's meaningful work that's important. And so more often than not, you're going to be met with enthusiasm. We're also launching an arts and cultural organizing hub, which is an online space to connect artists and organizers together to think about this stuff. So that's another great resource. There's a link at the end of the presentation for you to connect up with artists. Um, make space for visioning and collaboration. Um, it's really easy to kind of take the attitude of like, we need a flyer, we need a poster, we need a logo. And that's okay. Sometimes that's how it has to happen. But whenever you can, try to make space for collaborative visioning. Give folks to really think time creatively and boldly together um, because that really strengthens relationships, creates space for sharing personal stories, and helps people develop a deeper connection to our movement. Dedicate money and resources. Um, so, if you have a budget, great, 
pay artists. Um, and it doesn't have to be a lot. Um, and my advice is always to aim higher the next time, fundraise the next time. But even if it's just a little, recognizing folks' time and labor as artists and cultural producers is really important. If you don't have a budget, that's okay. Um, just be upfront about that and have a conversation about the resources that are available. And think about other things that um, you might be able to uh, trade. Maybe that's publicity, maybe that's skill sharing, you can think creatively about that. Um, you'll also want to think about um, a small budget for supplies, but sometimes you can get those donated as well. And again, in the how-to kits we have, um, there's information on the types of supplies you might need. Um, and finally, host an art build. Um, so it sounds more intimidating than it is, but that can just be an afternoon or evening of art making together, whether that's making signs, banners, coming up with a poster design. It's also a great organizing opportunity. Um, you can plan it just like you would plan any other organizing event. Remember to think about things that make the space and time accessible to people of all abilities. Um, think about food, having activities pre-prepared so it's easy for folks to, uh, to plug in and for kids, parents, and folks of all ages to participate as well. Um, and then make sure you've got a plan for connecting participants to next steps and actions. Um, we have a whole toolkit to help you plan an art build, which you'll also be getting a link to. Finally, Avery already covered this, so I will not spend a lot of time here, but take photos and videos. In the making of art, when it's out in the world, when you're done with it, um, take photos and videos and share them. And I have our climate jobs and justice hashtag, Avery shared, rise for climate justice, and other hashtags that we will also be using. So I will defer to Avery on the hashtag, um, but be sure to share those out in the world. It's also something that if you are pitching media um, and they wanna come and interview you, art builds and spaces where you're creating art is a great visual up backdrop for um, interviews and media opportunities. Um, and finally, I'm just gonna end with resources. So I'll skip this, but this is just a list of all the resources that you'll be getting after the call. And I wanted to end with three actions you can take. So you can join our PCM Arts and Cultural Organizing Hub. You'll be getting a link to that. Um, it's gonna be an exciting space where we'll share skills, hopefully make space to create together and then connect each other to artists, to organizing opportunities and projects for RISE and beyond. Um, take some art and share some art. We'll be getting a link to a whole cache of posters that we've created um, by artists across the country. Use them, they can be adapted for your purposes um, and you can share them and use them in whatever way you want. And finally, um, tomorrow we have, um, we're doing a really big push, a digital push uh, surge to get folks to get the word out about RISE. Uh, so we created this super short video that kind of shows off our posters. Um, so if you wanna kind of get hype going for arts and cultural organizing, please share this video tomorrow or share it with the artists in your lives to get them involved. Use it as a pitch um, to get folks into our movement. And with that, I'll end with questions. And it seems like there's some rolling in, so I'll take a minute to read through these guys. Ah, beautiful. Okay, Catherine Clark writes, you can probably read this too, but I'll do a dramatic reading. Our local river has played an important role in our community. Maybe we could make our march look like its own river by encouraging blue poster board for sign making, maybe in wave shapes. Beautiful, that's amazing. Um, there's actually lots of visual inspiration, both on 350's website and ours for simple shapes and wave shapes, some that you saw in the earlier images, but that's a great, beautiful, simple visual that you could use and repeat to really create unity. And I love that idea, like a river of people. Um, let's see, Lindsay popped in there with a um, good example of photos in a press release. So it sounds like we'll have some time certainly to answer more questions about comms, media stuff and press releases. Avery, rise for climate, hashtag rise for climate and hashtag why we rise to tell your stories. Um, and then Lindsay also says we're inviting media to our NYC art build, awesome. Um, that is the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take more questions about um, arts and cultural organizing and storytelling or hand it over for a big Q and A with the other wonderful presenters. At the bottom of the screen, you have my email address. So please feel free to get in touch if you have any questions about what I presented on and thank you so much for your work. Awesome. Thank you, Ingrid, so much. The art portion is always so beautiful and the images are just amazing. <laughs> so thank you for sharing those. Um, I hope everybody's excited now about all of the beautiful ways that you can tell the story of your action and your group and what you guys are putting together. I know I feel really inspired after hearing everyone speak tonight. 
Um, does anybody I'll open it up for any final questions or does anybody want to tell us about what kind of art they're doing um, for RISE? Is anybody brave enough to share with the group what they're doing? <laughs> Amy, talk about your art. Oh, um, I, yeah, totally, I will. Well, I am from Colorado and so I organize with 350 Colorado outside of 350.org and um, we're gonna be highlighting the impacts of climate change on Cal Colorado and the West. So we're gonna make big, huge flames out of cardboard and we're gonna do a die-in um, to symbolize all the people that have died in needless forest fires this last year. And we're gonna try to take an aerial photo um, from the top of the courthouse. And we're just, I'm, we're gonna do a big art build at the UCC church. They're giving us some space to paint banners and signs and make flames and um, then we're going to do empty chairs to symbolize um, some of our local elected leaders who are absent from fighting for climate. So that's kind of what we have going on in Colorado right now. Does anybody else want to share? I'll okay. defer that question to Ingrid. <laughs> yeah. um, that's a great question. You know what? I would just say um, I don't see a problem with it, but what I'd want to do is check in with the artist who made that art. Um, so I would suggest you get in touch with me um, and then we would just reach out to them to make sure they're okay with it. Um, that would be my recommendation for that. You're welcome. Perfect. Um, does anybody else want to talk about any art there? doing for RISE or anything they were inspired by this evening? If not, um, don't forget to text RISE to 83224 so you can receive updates on RISE in text form and share that with your group. Send it out in your emails, your tweets, your Facebook posts, um, just so people can keep track of RISE because you get that text and it's something you read instantly um, rather than an email that you have to sc scroll through. You know, it's kind of a teaser, so you want to share that with people. Um, and then all of the resources that, um, <laughs> Patty, it's 83224, and I'll put it in the chat, and um, <laughs> I got it before I did. Um, and then all the resources will be on the website tomorrow when we get the video uploaded and fixed up, and we'll get that on the website along with all the resources that we shared tonight, especially all the beautiful art kits and everything that Ingrid and our art director, David Solnit, um, have been putting together and watching all the things come together from all these art builds in California is absolutely inspiring. And so I hope all of you do an art build and do something beautiful. Um, and then to push it on social media, we all know that's important and we get lax in it, but it really is important to use the digital storytelling because you reach an audience and you bring more people into your volunteer base when they see you know, what a beautiful action you guys did. They're going to say, gosh, that's the organization I want to, you know, I want to volunteer with. Um, so, and if anybody has any questions, they can always email me and I will point you in the right direction, whether it's to Ingrid, Avery, Lindsay, or uh, Sanu and get you all taken care of. So thank you guys very much for joining us tonight. Yeah. <laughs> And Avery shared all the cool hashtags, so check those out in the chat. And the tell your stories about why you rise. Yes, we should definitely see, especially with a month left, um, make a little video. Just practice for your event. This is actually a really good practice step for the big shebang is to make a really awesome little, you know, make it a minute, minute and a half, two minutes, just, you know, why we rise, show some of your art, tell about your event. And then cross post it all over social media and send it out in emails too when you're inviting people to your action, like why we're rising. So, Can I or, yeah, I was gonna say, Ingrid or Amy, <laughs> have anything else? Go for it. <laughs> yeah, just one last quick thing exactly what Amy was saying. And a great time to do that will be tomorrow. It's August 8th. That's officially one month out from Rise at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific time. We're gonna have a huge social storm encouraging everyone to post their stories whatever rise content you want using hashtag rise for climate or hashtag why we rise again that's at 3 p.m eastern noon pacific time 
Well, I would like to give a very big thank you to all of our trainers tonight. Everybody works really hard to put these presentations together to be able to share their inspiration and their vision. And it means so much to us and to everybody I'm sure that joins these calls. Thank you for your dedication and being here. And we will see you guys next week um, for another training. So good night, everybody. Thank you all. Good night. Thanks, everybody.